they, and I know, I think you're probably about to do this, but if you're not, so th this man could be a high priest, but it's associated with the temple. This is not a man, number one, this is not about the second coming. It's not something that's far off in the distance. This is something that's, that's soon. And it's not a man in the church. It's not the man of lawlessness in the church. It's the man of lawlessness in the temple. In, right? And, yeah, yeah. Now, that, now, keep in mind that through, throughout the Reformation era, they took the temple here as being the church. Right. And, 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 and the, I get that. The, and I, and, yeah. yeah, go ahead. The papacy was the Antichrist, and, that, and they, right. they futurized this. We okay. had a little bit of that talk last time I had you come on the show. but like, And, and I love the reformers, but I, I completely understand what you're saying in the sense that, that this is talking about, it seems as though it's talking about Judaism. Yeah, I, I believe so. And there, and there is a, I have a... Okay, so Joel Webin there is just summarizing the high partial preterism of uh, Gary DeMar. And, um, of course, the evidence is clear that this is an abandonment of the Reformation. Okay, so in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 here, the high partial preterists are going to say this coming, right? It says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that this is not talking about the second advent, but the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment upon uh, the Jews in Jerusalem specifically and uh, the destruction of the temple, which all took place in 70 AD. That's what this is talking about, according to the high partial preterists. So the high partial preterists, this is why I call them high partial preterists, is because they view the vast majority of Bible prophecy as only surrounding what happened to the temple and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that it, that it was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman armies. Okay, this is an abandonment, once again, of the Reformation. So, for example, here's Matthew Henry's commentary. Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. Okay. What does Matthew Henry say? At the second coming. Notice, at the second coming. He knows this is talking about the second advent. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about the second advent. The second coming of Christ and all the saints being gathered together to him. This, this gathering of the saints together unto Christ at his coming shows that the apostle speaks of Christ coming to judgment day, not of his coming to destroy Jerusalem. Again, this is Reformation teaching here, that this is talking about the second advent of Christ. There will be a general meeting of all the saints at the second advent, and none but the saints. All the Old Testament saints, notice, who got acquaintance with Christ by the dark shadows of the law and saw this day at a distance, right? Abraham, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. And all the New Testament saints to whom life and immortality were uh, brought to light by the gospel, they will all be gathered together at the same time at the second advent. All right. They shall be gathered together to Christ. He will be the great center of their unity. They shall be gathered together to him, to be attendants on him, to be assessors with him, to be presented by him to the Father, to be with him forever and altogether happy in his presence to all eternity. Glorification. Glorification of all the saints from all time takes place at the second coming of Christ. He will resurrect all his dead, his, his dead saints, and all the living saints will be glorified in an instant, the twinkling of an eye. Uh, the doctrine of Christ's coming and our gathering together to him is of great moment and importance to Christians. Otherwise, it would not be the proper matter of the apostles' obtestation. We ought therefore not only to believe these things, but highly to account of them also, and look upon them as things we are greatly concerned in and should be much affected with. I agree 100% with Matthew Henry. Um, let's see. False doctrines. The man of sin will promote false doctrines. The apostasy foretold. 
the general apostasy. By this apostasy, we are not to understand a, a defection in the state or from civil government, but in spiritual or religious matters. From sound doctrine, instituted worship and church government and a holy life, the apostle speaks of some very great apostasy, not only of some converted Jews or Gentiles, but such as should be very general, though gradual, and should give occasion to the revelation of the rise of Antichrist, that man of sin. The apostasy in the apostasy in Second Thessalonians here, the rebellion, this is the apostasia, the falling away from true doctrine. The falling away or a departure from the once for all delivered unto the saints' faith. And that is, of course, what we have in papal Rome. Now, Gary DeMar knows what the Reformation teaches here. He's just denying it. That's all with his high partial preterism, which is a radical departure from the Reformation. So we have Matthew Henry. So Jonathan Edwards also says, the time when the reign of Antichrist began, the 1260 years of Antichrist reign, did not commence until after the fall of the Roman Empire. That's what Jonathan Edwards is talking about here when he says the Antichrist reign did not commence before the year of Christ. That is A.D. Anno Domini. He calls it the year of Christ. I like that so much. 479, that is the fall of the Roman Empire. So, for example, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, and this is chapter 26 of the church, in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, says correctly, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only head of the church, the only head of the church. We could put the word only in there because that's what they meant. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin, son of perdition, the man of lawlessness, son of destruction in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They're taking that language directly from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They even quote it right here. Okay? They even quote it. That exalts himself in the church against Christ. Now, why do we say that Paul is talking about the church when he says the man of lawlessness, son of perdition, or son of destruction, sits in the temple of God. Why do we say that? Well, right here. The, um, the rebellion, apostasy, falling away from the faith, departure from the faith, not a departure from the earth as in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's not what apostasy means. And of course, the... Man of lawlessness sits in the temple of God. Paul means the church here. As he often refers to the church of Christ as the temple. See 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 6.16, Ephesians 2.21. If, if, and see also John 2.21 where John says the temple is in fact the body of Christ. Of course, we call the church the body of Christ. Uh, that's one of the labels we give to the church. Um, but the... The high partial preterist would have to say that Paul, in 2 Thessalonians, in, call, in saying the man of sin, son of perdition, sits in the temple of God, meaning the church of God. If you, don't, if you think Paul is talking about the actual temple that was standing when Paul wrote this, then you're saying that Paul is inconsistent with himself. Paul is inconsistent with himself. He called the church the temple of the living God. Over and over again, in Ephesians, in, 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 in 1 and 2 Corinthians, uh, we have this idea. You're going to have to say Paul is inconsistent with himself because he's referring to the literal temple at this time. No, he's not. He's referring to the church. That's the way the authors of the 1680, 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And I did have the... Um, the uh, This represents the papal church state. That is the man of sin, son of perdition, sitting in the church. And, of course, we have the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25. The Pope is that Antichrist, the Bishop of Rome, that man of sin, son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church, that is in the temple. 1689 uh, Baptist Confession, we, all, we already looked at that. And historicist Dr. John Gill, what was the restraining power, which was restraining the rise of the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, the Antichrist, Papal Rome? But that 
by that which uh, withheld, let, or hindered the open appearance of Antichrist were the Roman Empire and emperors. These stood in his way, and while this empire lasted, the Roman Empire, and the emperors wore the imperial crown, the popes could not come at the height of their ambition, dignity, and authority. Nor, uh, nor could the whore of Babylon, notice Revelation chapter 17, the whore of Babylon, is the same entity as the man of sin, son of perdition of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is from John Gill. Nor could the whore of Babylon take her seat and sit upon the seven hills of Rome until the Roman emperor was taken out of the way. Really, the Roman Empire. So these are historicist documents. The Westminster and the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. And we see Dr. John Gill and his proper exposition here of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We see Matthew Henry in his proper exposition of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, again, let us observe that no sooner was Christianity, talking about the apostasy, this apostasy, the falling away from the faith, it was so also in the Old Testament church. So, no, no sooner was Christianity planted and rooted in the world than there began to be a defection in the Christian church, the temple of the living God. It was so also in the Old Testament church. Notice how he calls it the Christian church and the Old Testament church. They're the same church, according to Matthew Henry. He's absolutely correct on that. And he gives examples from the Old Testament of the defections, the apostasies in the Old Testament. And so soon after the return out of captivity, there was a general decay of piety, and therefore it was no strange thing that after the planting of Christianity, there should come also a falling away or an apostasy, and that the Antichrist would take his rise from this general apostasy. That the... Um, Yeah, not of the coming to destroy Jerusalem. That's that's the second coming. It's not talking about his coming to destroy Jerusalem. I just wanted to make sure I touched. I don't, I don't know if I hit upon that. Um, but Matthew Henry goes on. It's 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 it's. See, thus the character is given. Thus have the bishops of Rome not only opposed God's authority and that of the civil magistrates who are called gods, but have exalted themselves above God and earthly governors in demanding greater regard to their commands than, the, than to the commands of God or the magistrate. He sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. As God was in the temple of old and worshipped there, and is in and with his church now, so the Antichrist mention is some usurper of God's authority in the Christian church. He claims divine honors. And to whom can this better apply than to the bishops of Rome, to whom the most blasphemous titles have been given as Dominu, Dominus Deus Noster Papa, our Lord God, the Pope, Deus Alter in Terror, in Terra, another God on earth, or Terre another god on earth okay idem est dominium de et pape the dominion of god and the pope is the same again blasphemous words he calls himself or takes the title uh, holy father people call him holy father that's blasphemous that that term holy father is only used once in scripture in john chapter 17 and it's in jesus high priestly prayer to his father and he calls him holy father for the Bishop of Rome to take on that title, Holy Father, is absolutely blasphemous to Bible-believing Christians. Should be blasphemous to Bible-believing Christians if they know anything about their Bibles. There was something that hindered or withheld or let until he was taken out of the way. That is, it was the power of the Roman Empire which stood in the way of the rise of the man of sin, son of perdition. It prevented the advances of the bishops of Rome to that height of tyranny to which soon afterwards they arrived. That is, after the fall of the Roman Empire, just like Jonathan Edwards said, then the bishops would rise to that height of tyranny to which um, the Bible speaks that they would. 
after the fall of the Roman Empire. Universal corruption of doctrine and worship in the Romish church came in by degrees. Universal corruption of doctrine and worship in the Roman, Rome, Romish church came in by degrees, and the usurpation of the bishops of Rome was gradual, not all at once. And thus the mystery of iniquity did the more easily and more insensibly prevail. The apostle justly calls it the mystery of iniquity because wicked designs and actions were concealed under false shows and pretenses. At least they were concealed from the common view and observation. By pretended devotion, superstition, and idolatry were advanced, and by a pretended zeal for God and his glory, uh, what we, we would call a pseudo-pietas, a false piety, Okay, we see a lot of false piety today in our modern world. Um, think about all the, uh, the, the woke nonsense. It's really a, a form of pseudo-pietas, false piety. These people are going around trying to establish their own righteousness, their own piety, and they're trying to push these things on, on others and saying, basically, you are not righteous if you don't agree with us. Um, that's pseudo-pietas, false piety. Bigotry and persecution were promoted. And he tells us that this mystery of iniquity did even then begin or did already work. While the apostles were yet living, the enemy came and sowed the tares. There were then the deeds of the Nicolaitans, etc. Let's see. The manner of his coming or ruling and working. So again, this is Matthew Henry's commentary. Read his commentary. It's really good. Uh, he's got a lot of excellent things to say here on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So Matthew Henry, you got Jonathan Edwards, you got the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. You can see also the, um, I got the Westminster Confession of Faith in here. John Gill, uh, the Westminster Confession. Whoop. Yeah, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25, section 6. The Bishop of Rome is that Antichrist, that man of sin, 1689. Baptist Confession of Faith, the Antichrist is that man of sin, son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Roman Empire was restraining, historicist John Gill. We have uh, Matthew Henry. We have, uh, ooh, you know what, you know what, I wanted to, nah, maybe I won't get into my Hippolytus. Um, yeah, I'm getting a little long here. So, so let me just, let me just end it with this uh, because this is again this is a this is an abandonment of the Reformation these men these high partial preterists are abandoning the Reformation at this point um, that's my point so we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses if you're an historicist out there if you want to read Bible prophecy properly like the Reformation and post-reformation writers did then you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. The, these, men, these men are not surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses at all. <laughs> okay, Jonathan Edwards, Matthew Henry, authors of the 1689 Baptist Confession and the Westminster Confession, Charles Hodge, Charles Hodge. He, he sits in the temple of God, clearly to indicate that this is an ecclesiastical usurping, a tyrannical and persecuting power that is here depicted by the temple of God in this passage is, is generally understood the church, which is so often elsewhere called, and especially by Paul, God's temple. Yeah, we already looked at that, all the references. Some, however, suppose that a reference is to a literal temple in Jerusalem, preterists of the past, or that there is a temple to be rebuilt, futurists. Okay? Charles Hodge is refuting both of these, preterism and futurism. He says, no, nonsense. Um, so that's, anyway, you could read Hodge. Uh, this is uh, from Hodge, Charles Hodge, his uh, Systematic Theology, Volume 3, Volume 3, uh, under the Antichrist. Excellent section in Hodge. So, our great cloud of witnesses, the Reformation, we should listen to what they had to say. They were, they were correct on this issue. Gary DeMar, this is an abandonment. Just like dispensational futurism is an abandonment of the Reformation. 
So that's all I have to say. Uh, talk to you soon. Post your comments down below, all that stuff. Soli Deo Gloria.